welcome. The Pathology Innovation Collaborative Community is a regulatory science initiative that aims to facilitate innovations in pathology, as well as advanced safety and effectiveness evaluation. The PI Collaborative Community aims to harmonize approaches to speed delivery to patients through collaboration in the pre-competitive space. The PI CC is open to all stakeholders, public or private, including, but not limited to, academia, industry, healthcare providers, patients, and advocacy groups. Meetings of this kind are an example of lawful activity under federal antitrust law, because the focus of the meeting is on government action or policy, including the industry's responses or positions taken with respect to their team. However, antitrust monitoring is needed for companies' own protection, since they are direct competitors meeting together. These meetings need to stay within protected subject matters and need to be monitored so that they do not stray off into inappropriate areas, such as pricing and price terms, sales and service territories for particular products, customers and customer territories, each company's individual decisions regarding selection of suppliers or customers, marketing plans and especially future marketing plans for new product offerings, other proprietary or competitively sensitive information. Today's meeting will follow the written agenda and there will be no discussion of pricing or other prohibited topics. If the discussion veers into those topics, we will terminate the discussion. If you have any questions or concerns about the propriety of a discussion, please raise it immediately and we will take a break to determine how best to proceed. The Medical Device Innovation Consortium acts as the formal convener and we will follow their conflict of interest policy. For additional information, we defer to our code of conduct and our website, www.pathologyinnovationcc.org. We look forward to moving the field forward. This looks great. Give it one more minute or so. I see that there's multiple people joining and coming in. Mark is on. Hey, Mark. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Hi, Rob. Uh, this meeting is, uh, in fact, Courtney is planning to cancel it, so. No one is going to cancel this meeting. <laughs> no, that was some background noise from someone. Um, let's get started. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome here at this Pathology Innovation Collaborative community um, two, and I think maybe three representatives, yes, as well, from Friends of Cancer Research, an advocacy group from DC who are advancing cancer research through collaboration. And while there are many, many different ways how you can actually conduct yourself in the patient advocacy business, Friends has a very unique approach, um, very regulatory science heavy, which of course we know and love. And it's really a pleasure to have you here, uh, Brittany, Mark and Hillary. And you see already people are still dropping in. Um, so without further ado, maybe I hand it over to introduce your approach to you know, advance cancer research. And I think, Brittany, you're you're the person presenting, right? So that would be great. Yes, absolutely. Well, well, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share a little bit about uh, Friends of Cancer Research and our model for research partnerships and harmonization efforts. Um, as Joe noted, Friends is a, an advocacy organization. We're based in DC and really focus on driving collaboration among partners uh, really across uh, the healthcare sector, advances in, in science and policy and regular regulation uh, with the goal really being patient focused to help speed life saving treatments for patients. And uh, my name is Brittany McCulvey. I'm a science policy analyst and I've been with friends for a little over a year. Um, and I'm also joined on the call with my colleagues, uh, Mark Stewart, uh, who is our Vice President of Science Policy, and Hilary Styers, who is also a Science Policy Analyst. Our background, we're all uh, PhD trained biologists who have now kind of moved into the policy side. 
director of sitting on the, the PICC monthly calls. Um, and Joe has hopefully had the pleasure of being involved in many of our work streams. Um, and, and thought it would be valuable, as he noted, to, to quickly share with the group our model for these partnerships that we have, um, but also hopefully to be able to then spend a lot of time at the end discussing potentials for how this model could be applied in the digital pathology space. And so I just have a few slides again to kind of give a brief introduction of how Friends operates. Um, and again, our model here is really focused on collaboration and bringing together multiple stakeholders. We recognize that we are absolutely not the experts uh, for all of our projects that we do and that we need uh, key leaders in the field to really advance these projects. And so we first identify key challenges in oncology drug development and in the cancer space. These can come from leaders in the field uh, providing us with some challenges through FDA, patients, et cetera. And then again, focus on bringing together those key leaders and a diverse group of stakeholders to help address these challenges. Our first goal is to simply conduct almost like a landscape assessment. So really trying to understand where the field is currently, where those challenges uh, and issues are, but then also to really focus on uh, proposing solutions. And then through this, hopefully publish this information in a white paper or a peer reviewed publication. Uh, but our work really doesn't stop there. We're not focused on just increasing uh, citations and getting out in the literature, but really want to focus on taking some of those ideas that are published and implement them. And so forming these research partnerships or groups to help implement uh, these potential solutions we've proposed and to help for focusing on alignment. And then using data that are produced in these research partnerships to help drive change. Uh, specifically, we focus on from policy and a regulatory side, but also advancing science and patient care as well. And so today, I just want to briefly walk through a couple of our research partnerships that use this model, um, not at all to dive into the data uh, from any of these projects, but to hopefully give a sense of how this model works. And as we continue to think about this and applying this in the digital pathology space. And so the first project I just want to briefly highlight is on our tumor mutation or burden harmonization project, which has uh, concluded uh, for now. And this is focusing, as, as many of you probably are aware, on TMB, a biomarker that helps predict the likelihood a patient uh, with cancer will benefit from IO therapies. And at the start of this project, you know, there really was a lack of standardization for being able to calculate and TMB which impacted its use uh, as a biomarker and value for patients. And so with identification of this problem, uh, friends convened multiple stakeholders to help develop a unique research partnership, really focused on, again, aligning strategies. So first, reviewing the current methods, that kind of current landscape assessment for calculating and reporting, and then working towards creating a consensus solution for how best to standardize them. And this took place over multiple phases. Uh, most of our projects are across multiple phases. Uh, and so here just briefly summarize kind of the process that was used in the TMB harmonization project. Uh, so in our first phase, conducting an in silico analysis to help identify sources of variability uh, between using a whole exome sequencing approach for identifying TMB versus the different targeted panels that were being used in the clinic to calculate TMB. This was with 11 different laboratories and using TCGA data. We then in phase two moved on uh, with 16 different laboratories using cell lines that were derived from tumors uh, and creating a, a reference standard using that whole exome sequencing approach and looking at variability of after alignment of the TMB scores from those targeted panels in the clinic to the reference standard. And so then lastly in phase three, uh, working to propose standards for actually defining clinical application of TMB, and importantly, developed a calibration tool that's publicly available uh, to help promote reproducibility and comparability across assays. And so again, not wanting to go into the data today, um, but uh, highlights the multi-phase approach that I just noted on the previous slide, uh, using many different data sources, including TCGA, uh, our cell lines and tumor FFPE tissue, 
Uh, for this project, we did create a gold standard. Um, I'll highlight another project where we're not necessarily creating a gold standard, but again, if uh, that need arises, and this was through whole exome sequencing, to then be able to compare uh, across different laboratories, panel specific TMB assays. And you can see an example of some of the data output looking at 16 labs here on the graph on the right in comparison to the whole exome sequencing uh, TMB gold standard. And so with a project like this, uh, our output is we uh, do publish in peer-reviewed literature, uh, multiple manuscripts, including again, those kind of overarching recommendations and principles, as well as the specific analyses that were conducted that I highlighted, as well as present at different conferences and public meetings. And we cannot do this with all of our partners, and this just shows and highlights uh, the, the partners that are on these projects. Uh, we have involvement uh, with many federal agencies. FDA is very much involved in our work, as well as NIH and NCI. Uh, we also have many different academic uh, clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, uh, and laboratories and partners in this project. And so then, uh, just to share one more example, uh, is our current project that we have ongoing that my colleague Hillary is running, looking at homologous recombination deficiency, or HRD which is another very complex biomarker. Uh, and this uh, biomarker is used to help identify patients that may benefit from PARP inhibitors or other DNA repair targeting drugs. And again, uh, we identified much like TMB, an issue with the way that HRD was being defined, measured, and reported uh, across different assays and impacting patient care. Uh, even maybe a little bit more complex than TMB, where at least TMB was all looking at mutations, where HRD could be looking at mutations, it could be looking at genomic star scarring, it could be looking at loss of heterozygosity. There's lots of different uh, components with HRD. And so again, established a unique partnership to help work on alignment strategies uh, for all of the different ways that HRD was being measured to help uh, align and, and create some sense of consistency for determining HRD status to help benefit its use as a biomarker. And so again, this is a multi-phased approach. Uh, our first phase, uh, like I illustrated with the model, was really that type of landscape as assessment and analysis. So under HRD was being uh, determined and to help propose a common language around the use of HRD. And this uh, was published in March of this year in The Oncologist, the paper focused again on the concepts and definitions. But then moving towards actually looking at, looking at the data. And so we're currently in phase two, which is really trying to understand the variability across these assays to then be able to identify opportunities for harmonization and then promote best practices. And so we're currently working with different diagnostic companies to help accomplish this goal. And then this will inform our phase three, uh, which is using these findings to really look at the clinical context and understand how this, uh, the impact between HRD and clinical outcome and help uh, work with clinical efficacy. And so just a little bit more about where we are with phase two, again, in that use of different data sources to help focus on alignment. Um, again, our phase two piece is really understanding the variability across assays. And so we have two pieces of this. First, again, an in silico piece that's using TCGA data. We have a common source uh, where all the files are being stored through DNA Nexus that's de-identified the files and then shared all of the files with the diagnostic developers. Developers then run their own pipelines and analyses uh, to then be able to give us the HR status calls. And then we work with an NCI statistical team to help run statistical analyses to compare and look at the variability and sources of variability between these different assays. And the stats team is working off analyses that were developed as part of an SAP that a multi-stakeholder group, including these developers, uh, were a part of uh, and aligned on before we started with this project. And then we also have a patient sample analysis, uh, different over 100 different uh, ovarian cancer samples that are provided by University of Alabama at Burning, Birmingham. And then we have a central laboratory, Frederick National Laboratory, that's extracting 
uh, DNA and RNA from all of these tissues and distributing them against the diagnostic developer. The developers are running their assays, reporting back their HR status calls, and then again running analyses to understand the variability and potential sources of the variation. And so again, uh, a very busy slide to show just how many partners we have involved in this project. Uh, again, working closely with FDA, uh, with many clinical partners, the diagnostic developers. Uh, really, you know, again, we can't do these projects without the, the help of all of the different stakeholders and realize how very all the different perspectives are as we continue to move forward with these projects. And so again, this is supposed to be, you know, not really necessarily going into data, but really hopefully give you a sense of the type of projects that we conduct at Friends of Cancer Research and the use of our collaborative model. Uh, and, you know, I think even from my perspective, sitting on the PICC calls, you know, I think we recognize the really exciting work that's taking place in the digital pathology space uh, and also potentially where there may be needs uh, for more alignment and harmonization beneficial for both the field as well as for patients. And so we wanted to just take the opportunity today to, to share again a little bit more about our model, um, but also to hear from you all as far as potential opportunities to, to use this type of model in the digital pathology space. Um, I've listed here just a few opportunities again as we begin to think about this from our vantage point. Uh, again, kind of that landscape assessment sense is the first step to really understand the different potential use cases and considerations and approach looking at AI-driven digital pathology and oncology drug development, and then really focusing on identifying those key challenges and opportunities for alignment of this type of methodology and oncology drug development. And so with that, I'm absolutely happy to, to answer any questions, again, on, on our model, on our basic approach. My colleagues, Mark and Hillary, also I'm sure will be happy to answer any questions, but then would also love to, again, kind of dive into where we see uh, with this group where maybe there's some key challenges or opportunities to apply in digital pathology. Of course, the virtual applause I sent here on behalf of, of everyone, and this is, this is really a phenomenal structure and I would call it like cadence of, of steps that that you have developed in these various harmonization projects. I'm, I was personally involved in some so I can attest that those really work and they have already resulted in several key peer-reviewed publications that I know HRD is um, there's multiple on the TMB harmonization project and I also know the circulating tumor DNA, which you're heavily involved, is of course something really meaningful. So I think be before going to, you know, the topic that, that everyone here likes, which is digital path and AI, would, would you mind briefly first explaining some of the challenges? Because I think the, like understanding, you know, I mean, of course there are, there are many meetings and, you know, alignment between the various um, collaborators, but do you mind explaining those those key challenges in the initial stages are that that may be helpful for you know the members of PICC to understand how to initiate something like this. Sure, and I'm happy to also let Mark jump in since he's been involved in these a little bit longer than I have. I mean, I think again, it's challenges with this type of model, and I think there's a lot of opportunities with this model. It's getting the right people at the table and, and making sure that you have all the, the relevant stakeholders that can provide various perspectives. You know, we want to make sure that everyone's who needs to be. Um, and each project's different. So, for example, with TMB, where we, we have this gold standard HRD, we don't have a gold standard. We're just trying to understand variability. So I think there's a piece of once even the challenges are identified and, and thinking about those opportunities, really thinking about a research project that can help answer answer the questions that are needed in a way that's valuable, that's again involving everyone and not necessarily um, you know putting different pressures and pressure points where they don't need to be. Um, you know, I think we that there can be challenges with bringing such a diverse group together but usually more perspectives are are always better than than less perspectives uh, and we just have the the fun of kind of combining all of those to make sure that we're moving in a way that's 
in the end beneficial to patients. Yeah, I would add along the same kind of vein, just making sure that we're really transparent about where our opportunities and challenges are, our pitfalls in the, in the different analyses that we're performing. One of the criticisms or the conversations that we've had around one of our, um, our uh, analysis for HRD is just the sample size. And so ensuring that when we're creating the statistical analysis plan and then we're having conversations with not only our internal stakeholders, but those outside when we were presenting it publicly, that we're really careful about you know, our findings and, and how we're, we're doing that. But I think the three of us having scientific backgrounds has been really helpful in ensuring that we have that scientific integrity moving forward with the projects. Yeah, and just um, a, a few additional points. Um, one, you know, I think like Brittany had mentioned, these projects are possible due to the willingness of different stakeholders, you know, to come together and kind of a safe space. Um, and and often these were in this pre-competitive space, but people recognize the need and the value to really come together and tackle some of these challenges because there's really truly a benefit for for everyone. But you know, for some of those, you know, we we can have upwards of 100 different stakeholders at times participating in, in these conversations. And while that's great, just as complex as the topics are, so too are the opinions for how to uh, solve some of those. And so it's a lot to navigate, um, you know, but <clears throat> so, so that's some, some initial challenges that, that you, you know, you have to work through as part of, part of these groups. But again, at the end of the, the day, I think, you know, putting them out all out on the table and just working through them, you know, as a, as a group, you know, ultimately we arrive at something I think everyone can, can get behind and support. Uh, the other thing is just as Joe mentioned in this intro, the work that we do at Friends is really focused in the regulatory space, thinking about, you know, emerging new tools and technologies and data sources and um, making sure that the regulatory framework set up in a way to really leverage those to help support um, the development of new therapies and um, for, you know to benefit patients. Um, and with that, you know, we really have to structure our projects in a, in a way where not only you know can we kind of advance science behind behind some of this, but more importantly, do it in a way that um, yields important information that FDA can leverage to help um, inform their thinking and approach to how they're how how these are being integrated in, in drug development. That continues to be kind of an important mission of ours. All that to say is there's certainly you know important um, you know scientific questions, but for us you know we really have to prioritize the questions that we try to address as these groups and um, and kind of not lose track of that vision because oftentimes even you know for these data sets and the TMB project and, and the HRD project there's a whole host of you know important questions that can be addressed but don't want to lose sight of you know the overall goal and mission of the project well I think this is this is this is very helpful and I know uh, Brittany, Mark, Hillary, you, you've been in, in several of our PICC meetings and one of the is how to, you know, unlock the potential of digital pathology with or without AI. That by itself is already a big question. But before we go into the, the topics that are near and dear to, to my heart, um, I want to make sure that the, that the group has an opportunity. And I see a question from um, Trisha and Arul. Trisha, do you want to Word this out, or should I read it? I don't know if you're yeah, sure. on the call. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you, you for joining. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, yeah, I was I was curious about um, commercial company conflicts, and I've seen this before, and I've been in tech space for a long time before this, um, with standard settings for for USB standards, 5G standards, where certain companies like Qualcomm would have patents in the space or have been offering products, and obviously it's to their incentive to get the standard set. Um, along the lines of what they've already put out in the market. So similar in your HRD example, if you already have an assay in place that you're, you're, you're using and selling, um, you have a different incentive than the rest of the, the group potentially. 
Um, and I'm wondering if you've seen that conflict, and if so, how you've uh, how you've been, been able to manage through that. Start with a few thoughts, and let Hillary and Brittany chime in. It's an interesting. It is a scenario that we've had to work through, even in our TMB project and HRD project, and that a lot of the um, participants may have diagnostic tests that are in quite different stages of development. Um, it, it, was, it was not as much of an issue in TMB when we launched that project. At that time, there actually weren't any, you know, approved companion diagnostics at the time, and we it's obviously a, a lot easier to work in that space and for companies to be a bit more willing to take an introspective look and think about, you know, things that they might be able to modify now that can help them in the long run once they, you know, do, do get FDA approval and that companion diagnostic um, status. For the HRD project, we have a couple more assays that, you know, have been approved and have specific uses. And even in, in those cases, you know, certainly examples I'm sure you're all aware of, of even some of the discordance that might exist between those two assays. You know, one way we get a, we get around that is we, we don't set these projects up in a way to identify the winner. And um, they're really set up to understand the um, potential variability differences that might exist and occur um, simply due to maybe how one has formatted their bioinformatics pipeline or what types of mutations they're including or excluding. And so what we hope to walk away at the end of the day are you know, pros and cons or limitations that one should be aware of with differing approaches. And there could be pros and cons with each of these available assays that might vary depending on the setting or the nature in which the assay is being used. So I think, I think that helps us get around some of those concerns that companies might have if you were to come out and, and say, oh, you know, you're doing it entirely wrong. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's the case or else they likely wouldn't have gotten an approval, um, you know, for their assay. And the other the other point you made around kind of the um, I guess con potential conflicts maybe with setting standards, I certainly would could see that being the case of say you were working directly with a company. I think I think in our instances, we as you know, you could could see you know we we swore the one company in some cases you know most instances 10, 15, 20 companies, and to think that they all have the same <laughs> way to do something or they're all kind of aligned in what that standard should be is certainly a misconception because they all have very different approaches and 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 so i think just having kind of that diversity even though they're all in even though you know they might all be in industry um you know they're not always aligned in, in what the right way forward is and so you know we still have to work through those as a and again, I think at the end of the day, we do walk away with something um, more impactful because it was informed by, um, you know, more than one company and a diverse group of stakeholders. I think another key piece here too is that um, we we keep everything blinded unless the group agrees to unblind. And so, you know, the goal is not to, to Mark's point, highlight who's the quote unquote best or what the standard should be, just a general understanding. And so that kind of a non and being able to be anonymous is, a, I think, a very helpful thing. The other piece is that orders are not only those people. And so having our patient advocates and our um, clinicians and FDA there to be kind of that neutral third party in addition kind of keeps everybody aligned towards the goal of finding out the information that will help us to help patients. So I think both of those things, you know, the being anonymous and then having multiple additional stakeholders involved are really key to the success of our projects. Great. Do, do you always have like a regulator like the FDA or someone else in, in, in all these projects? Yeah, we work very closely with FDA specifically. Yes. And we found it very important to have them included early on. You know, at the end of right. the day, we want to influence and, and, and help shape you know, potential 
how these are being used from a regulatory perspective. And so the worst case would be is you have this group of people developing what you think is perfect solution and you give it to FDA and they're like, this is impossible. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't actually fix the issue we're encountering. You know, so so we always make a concerted effort to to keep FDA at all the stages, even when we're kind of planning out new projects. Great. Well, in, you know, and in, in fact, FDA is on the call, so you know we can <laughs> can definitely draw from this from these synergies. Um, maybe maybe one thing that is somewhat shared across the various friends projects is that it's always emerging technologies i think with with proven abilities but not quite let's call it fully implemented in clinical practice uh, uh, now now that we said fda brandon gallus is showing up what a what a coincidence <laughs> um no what what i meant to say is there's sort of a little bit of a conundrum when it comes to traditional pathology and cancer diagnostics because that is I would say a fairly established and um, almost a given for many of the trials and other efforts while AI is definitely the new kid around the block. It's not new when it comes to you know talking to computer scientists. Some of them say it's been around since the 80s, but it is definitely a very cutting edge technology when it comes to practice. Do you mind commenting on that? How, how you see this sort of combination of a traditional and a cutting edge technology? Yes, and in, in what way? I guess are you thinking about it in terms of a, a kind of setting a, a standard that could potentially limit innovation, or is not flexible enough to walk in kind of emerging approaches? Or technology? well, maybe maybe I can I can try to give an example. So. Let's say there's a technology AI that could potentially, let's say, increase the number of trial enrollments. And I'm just using that as an example to tie it back to patient benefits. So ultimately, that may harmonize certain regulatory approaches to get more trials done more eff efficiently or get drugs to patients earlier or find out whether they're efficient to get the efficient drugs to patients earlier. Definitely the enrollment criterion that a patient should have cancer to be enrolled in that trial. That's currently taken as a given, but it relies on largely single or dual pathology review, you know, depending on the trial design. But there's certainly variability in the, um, in the way that cancer is diagnosed, which is a professional opinion rendered after review of a slide. Now, whether eventually digital pathology combined with AI can reduce or limit the variability that hasn't been addressed in the field. But it is a combination. It's not like HRD, which is current, cannot currently be accomplished. So the aim of this project that you're, you're calling the HRD harmonization project is trying to find the criteria, harmonize that to improve the quality of that call. That's an innovation technology that doesn't have a, a, a precedent. But when it comes to cancer diagnostics, there is a precedent, which is this traditional modality right here using the, the light microscope. Um, I, I see certain challenges with that because it's, it's touching upon the very core, i.e. the cancer diagnosis. That's almost like not the innovation moving forward. It's almost going back and saying, you know, is, is there variability as a, as a first step? And then say, can we reduce that or can we limit it? And I'm... I'm at least not aware, you, you may have done other projects that I'm not aware of where you have tackled a problem like that, but this is touching the very diagnosis of cancer, right? So. Well, I think one of the key points is to understand the language. So when you talk about diagnosis, is it, you know, a specific technology to focus on IHC? Are you looking at just general morphology and that kind of thing? Because I think understanding the specific use case will help to then drive how those decisions are made. Um, so I, I would say that's one thing. And then, you know, because I think that the, the narrow scope of something like HRD allows us to dive in. Yes, there. I mean, as we mentioned, there's an approval already there. So it is a little bit 
of a retrospective. I think the challenge in digital pathology is that it is something that's around for a lot longer. And so, you know, things like what is the, what is truth? Is that, you know, a pathologist saying it or is it something from an algorithm? Those types of conversations don't necessarily come up in other use cases, but I think it's, I think it's a narrowing that would have to happen before we can start to understand exactly what those um, challenges might be. I don't know if Mark or Brittany have other thoughts. And I think that's where, again, you know, we look to groups like this to understand what, where are those use cases? Where should we be narrowing, you know, and, and that conversations like these are so helpful. Yeah. I mean, the team be, and the HRD project are obviously specific to, you know, a specific biomarker. But if you look at a high level, it outlines kind of an approach for harmonizing, you know, complex biomarkers generally. Um, and I would like to think helps highlight kind of a framework that could be embedded within, with, within our typical processes, even at know, that can help drive towards greater harmonization from the onset. Um, and again, we, we, we use these projects not only to advance the science around, you know, these specific topics, but how could they inform future, you know, policy as well. And so taking that higher level view and um, not just not to, I guess, repeat what everyone's just said, but, you know, for digital pathology, I think similar to our other approaches, you know, really you know, starting out with this landscape assessment, understanding what's what some of those opportunities and challenges are with this technology, but then when it comes to some type of collaborative project, you know, harmonization effort, you, you really got to dive into a specific use case. Ideally, that use case, while again, it's specific, hopefully there's enough there's some generalizable components that could be extrapolated to other other use cases within digital pathology, for instance. I mean, the, the specific use case we haven't settled on, I think, as a field. You know, if you ask individual developers, and I can't speak for all, but, you know, Certain groups like breast or prostate, they go by cancer type. Others go by the general mantra of, we want to read something out of a slide using AI that a human cannot do as quick or as efficiently or something that's not possible at all. For example, response to a certain therapy and numerous other, maybe some companies work on prediction of TMB from H&E slides and others may want to, you know, extrapolate HRD. I know that that field is currently exploding. So settling on a single use case may be probably the biggest challenge to get so many collaborators um, focus on one single topic because, you know, the, the group that works on a breast algorithm, as soon as we jump to lung, we'll say, oh, that's of no interest to us, etc. But the messages that you derive, for example, from the TMB or from, you know, the circulating tumor DNA, those are definitely the abstract or the, the meta level is definitely helpful and, and you know, to see. But I, I don't feel confident mentioning one single use case right now as the one that we should discuss. But I, I leave it open to the to the group to to chime in. And, and maybe one way to even approach it um, <clears throat> is thinking about it from the from you know, what those key questions or challenges are. And then from those prioritizing um, what we think the potentially what an overarching challenge is or what a near term challenge is that, you know, if, if only we could kind of work through this, it could open the doors for other things. And then if you can identify that, then it's well, what what's the use case that can help one try and work through that question or develop some solutions. And I often think about, I think it was, you know, it was, actually I saw it here, you know, when, when uh, Roberto Salgado and, and Brandon were talking about the cancer and, and TILS project, I think, you know, that's, that's an interesting case study that, you know, I can envision some components that are informative, you know, for other areas in terms of 
how one can go about establishing kind of a reference standard um, and then what the, the uses of that reference standard could be from a developmental standpoint, but and then but more importantly, you know, how those could be used when submitting, you know, an application to FDA, for instance, and, and having kind of confidence and in the and in, in the the product itself. I I fully agree. I think Brandon is on the call, maybe he can comment. It would certainly be very novel to focus on a morphologic biomarker and treat it almost like rinse and repeat, like some of your NGS-based approaches, but to really put a morphologic account-based and ROMA account-based morphologic biomarker through the same, you know, rubric um, like an NGS or, a, you know, multi-gene signature. It would be just a, an interesting scientific approach, but. I don't know if Brandon or Kate want to chime in on, on this. I do apologize. I got stuck and only arrived late. Um, but what I heard Mark just talking about is the example study that I'm doing in the pills space and microscopy space um, for how to utilize pathologists as the reference standard. So I'm still trying to figure out um, the current, um, I guess you guys talked about use cases and how to choose which ones are the best ones. Um, just uh, with that issue, you know, I'm trying to find where my next funding is coming from to support research assistance um, and things like that. And so and when I'm writing my next grant, I start thinking how from that project to my next one and currently me um, you know I'm going I, I've done a lot of diagnostics that are binary decisions is there a tumor or not and is this a disease patient or not um, because of the data type um, that the task that's involved is a binary task the current work is on TILS which is a quantitative measurement um, and that is because I wanted to move from that, the statistical analysis methods and the sourcing and the, uh, the designs and the data collection related to di that binary diagnostic task. And I wanted to move into uh, quantitative measurements, right? Uh, still coming from the pathologist, that's kind of my niche, that's my home. Um, but when I think of the next step, then I, you know, on my radar is marks on images and segmentations. And actually my colleague here is uh, basically focused on uh, methods to assess segmentation methods or um, you know, any kind of segmentation method so that we can have a, a, a regulatory assessment um, paradigm for that kind of data. And so I know I've, I've looked at the slides and, and whole genome assessment um, is kind of featured there. Um, that's definitely a space that I have not gotten into. Um, and I know there's, but that I know we do have some coverage in that area in research with uh, especially the precision FDA kind of efforts. And hopefully you have the right people that would um, maybe I saw on the slide too that FDA was in that long list of collaborators. Um, but so I think that's just to highlight it's, you know, it's what kind of data is being collected, whether it's the acquisition data or the, the, the decision making data. Um, how do, how can we put a nice paradigm around that? And obviously, the more we can do that in a consensus space for other people that from following that paradigm. Um, that's kind of the progression to different projects that I, I kind of follow. So I hope that wasn't too long a digression or maybe that it was actually helpful. <laughs> but I'm trying to get caught up in this specific meeting, sorry. I mean, a, a morphologic biomarker has so far, at least to my knowledge, never been approved by the FDA. So that would be definitely cutting edge. And I 
um, of whether other examples, let's say mitotic figures or certain differentiation is, is a better example, but tills comes to mind because you know what, what Brandon has has demonstrated and published on is you know the approach to gather the ground truth and the you know multi-reader multi-assessment statistical framework for it so that hasn't been done for other morphologic biomarkers so i think that that's definitely one of the use cases that that, that so, you know so i gotta say morphological biomarker is not a biomarker what numeric thing that you get is it a density is it a count is it um you know a spatial extent a size you know bi morphological biomarker is a concept but it's not a, a it's not data yet right so the i the whole idea is what exactly are you measuring to call it a morphological biomarker we do have um some draft guidance i think it's still draft on quantitative imaging in search um I'll work to get the link put into the chat here, but it's the idea of that. What is the imaging, what is the value, the imaging value, the number that you're getting from this morphological biomarker? And that's what set the stage for how do you collect that data and how do you analyze that data? It's all about data types. So you know, as as part of the regulatory science, we can we can challenge current paradigms. So I agree that numerical, but there's also just regular qualitative uh, biomarkers. As long as I agree, um, measurable whatever that measurement is. But I think TILS is definitely numerical, so that lends itself to certain statistical approaches. But what I meant is, you know, if you count it, it depends on how you count it. It could be done manually, it could be done with computer assisted technologies, but um, maybe to come back to sort of the harmonization projects from friends, let's just assume for, let's say for discussion's sake, would agree that something like TILS or TILS for the discussion would be of interest to many stakeholders. How do you approach, let's say, from this ideation stage towards a project? Um, how, how do you approach that? Um, if, if you can outline that, it would be amazing. Is that me or friends? Friends, I think. Um, <laughs> or, or you. I mean, the A um, asks for input, then more people listen maybe you can even combine that but i mean it definitely takes time in the space right where you are understanding the problem and you're talking with colleagues and collaborators and people are throwing ideas at, against the wall and the ones that get the most eyebrows raised and the ones that get people raising their hand to, to participate and the ones that actually start doing work that's obviously where the uh, how you establish that direction uh, this is my quick answer. The composite, I think it's, it, it's somewhat difficult. Um, you kind of know when you know, but, uh, but but having said that, you know, I think there's some approaches we use. I think one, not to state the obvious, I think the value of a collaborative project is that you're tackling a question that not one entity could just solve themselves. Otherwise, there's not really a point in it. So I think finding a challenge where everyone recognizes that the only way forward is by working together is one key step. I think that other kind of key component we think about when it comes to our works, you know, you know given that we're kind of, we consider ourselves kind of this um, unique entity within the advocacy world, we obviously all of our work is geared towards helping improve the lives of patients with cancer. And so when we're tackling an issue, we don't want it to be so abstract that you don't really understand what the implications are, impact it might have on a patient. And so thinking about those that have real near-term um, actions, some that are maybe even emerging in, in recent clinical trials, but we kind of see the writing on the wall that if we don't have some harmonization or standardization or tackle this issue, we may not fully realize the benefit or it's going to get rolled out in a way where it's going to be kind of detrimental. I mean, 
I think about the whole PDL1 space, I think that's just a good example of, you know, some of the challenges that can occur without, you know, harmonization or standardization early on, if you come in on the back end, well, it's really hard to change things at that point. So making sure that you're coming in at the right time um, and that there's a you know, clear objective and implication with the work that you're doing is important from our standpoint. And I think when Mark says, you know, you know, like that's part of what that landscape assessment looks like. So the manuscript that Brittany highlighted for HRD emerged from conversations with multiple stakeholders about where the problems actually were. And so once we can align in what the problems are and where the potential opportunities are, then you can start to see things boil to the top as to which direction we should be taking a project. And sometimes those conversations end with, you know, it doesn't really look like there's a lot of opportunity at this point. We're going to continue to watch where the research is going and see if there's opportunities down the line. Let's think about other chances that we might have. But it really is a, you know, more of that collaborative kind of discussion. We don't just say, okay, this is the way that we think we should go. Let's move forward. It's really where does the field feel is most important and necessary at this point. I mean, I think the, the TILS field is a, is a great one, especially when you're interested in breast, you know, some already um, ongoing trials assess the predictive value. So it is sort of similar to the early stages of TMB and HRD. Um, I think the, the issue or the tricky part is that as a, if you consider it a diagnostic biomarker, the analytic modalities of measuring it haven't been concretely defined in a, you know, definitive way. I think there are definitely papers out there, but um, there's definitely no harmonization yet. And I think Brandon's work is tackling that. So in a way that, that measures the histologic biomarker in a quantitative fashion, how or when to apply this remains to be, to be determined. I think, I don't know if that's an accurate reflection. I'm not, you know, a TILS researcher, but I think that that sort of the, the state that um, at least an, an, a pathologist knows where that, where that ha field is heading. Um, yeah. Other questions about the approach, and it doesn't have to be tills. That's just <laughs> a concrete topic that may be a bit easier. In you know some of the discussions that we had up to this point is also um, are trials actually tracking the morphology, right? Meaning, I mean, most of the central lab tests um, send, for example, for TMB or HRD, if that's the biomarker of choice for enrollment, they send an H and E slide. A central reference lab scan those slides and they're available, for example, to derive secondary endpoints, right? A lot of AI companies are very interested in those, a, um, those H and E slides because instead of, you know, deriving TMB scores, which is a very expensive test to then predict something, and you may call that an enrollment criterion. I know that a lot of AI companies are looking into, can, can't we just predict response from the H&E slide? Have you considered some of these, let's call it more cutting edge and more issues, um, or is that all sort of future or science fiction? I'd be lying if we didn't already have a few use cases that that are in mind, but but they're but they're just um, you know ideas at this point, um, and don't want to you know sway people in one way or the, in, in one direction or or another. But maybe based on what you just said, so one one challenge um, might be having access to a diverse rep set of, of slides, for instance, to train your algorithm on this to perform some function. So that's a challenge. A specific use case one might be able to tackle with that challenge in mind is, is um, well, obviously there's a lot of interest in, say, a, um, a lung panel, for instance, that you could pre-screen patients with lung cancer to understand who would benefit from genomic testing, for instance, particularly if your drugs are a biomarker. And, 
uh, maybe less than one percent of patients who even have that if there was a way you could implement some type of screening to say this patient is highly likely to have this marker and therefore you're enriching your patients that you're you're funneling them to get genomic screening for instance or avoiding you know certain tests that you know likely aren't going to result in anything for that patient that could be a use case so you could bring together a group of pharmaceutical companies to think through well, what does the infrastructure need to look like is there some repository or database that one could use to where you drop these in that then are available to the you know to, to um, developers to you know develop such an assay another one another one's you know in this um her her too low um, status space I and mean, there's still uh, some papers that have come out even from david rem recently that have highlighted the uh, discordance there. Um, I'm kind of getting into an area that Hillary's more at than I am, but there's a lot of activity in the digital pathology space to try and bring harmony where there's a lot of disharmony just from how different pathologists might look or review a slide, for instance. So we know there's there's clinical trials that read out even at ASCO that could certainly benefit or could leverage this technology. Um, and so that could certainly be an emerging area in a specific use case, for example, on highlighting the value of these, but then um, addressing and how it could help address some challenges that are occurring with how things are done. Um, and how this new technology could help alleviate some of that. Um, and it opens the door for other things. You know, obviously it kind of changes the, the potential workflow and people often don't like that when your workflow uh, changes. Um, and so you could work through some of that as well. But I mean, those are just two that come to the top of mind. I, I like the idea of the HER2 low because that's definitely one of those, again, biomarkers or biomarker subgroup that affects a lot of patients. I mean, the, you know, HER2 low subgroup providing ad additional, you know, it's a specific therapy, of course, that's, that's um, identified now, but it's a large subgroup that would benefit from this particular or let's say from the limitation of the variability of the identifying that subgroup. Yeah, I mean, and, the, and you know, it has implications. I mean, patients not being offered a drug that could potentially benefit them simply due to how one pathologist happened to have read their slide. You know, so having, not to say that you need to remove the pathologist, but it doesn't ever hurt to have kind of a, a built-in second opinion. The digital pathology could be the second opinion that's been, you know, reviewed by the pathologist, for instance, to confirm. Well, I think I think that is that's definitely a great a great topic. Other final comments as we approach the top of the hour, Brandon. I'll just throw it out because Mark's conversation made me start thinking of the other use cases and um, you know impact and and ubiquity uh, of a biomarker is the mitotic figure counting biomarker because it I think it's part of assessing all cancers and I'm the mathematician in the group but it, I feel like I've seen as a biomarker that really touches on a lot of cancers and um, quantitating that better and that's what i think i'm hearing from mark too on that her too is it's really about quantitating it better so that we can have better thresholds for patient management decisions and um and uh, so i just wanted to throw my product figure counting in there because density that i'm working on is very the the data looks a lot like the metodic figure counting but my product figure counting then is also discrete data it counts and it's so it's just um, little different to it but um the methodology and the paradigms for truthing is is all um still i think ben would benefit from better methodology there awesome with that after covering i think topics from tmb hrd pdl one her too low um 
tills all the way to my Toddic figures. I wanted to give a big thanks to, to Brittany, Mark and Hillary from Friends of Cancer Research and uh, thanks a lot. We will distribute this on our usual pathway. Hopefully be able to join with a very concrete idea and you know, hope to, to continue to have support from friends. Great, thank you very much and thank everyone for, for joining. Thank you.